This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we spend the hour with David Byrne, the celebrated musician, artist, writer, cycling enthusiast, filmmaker, and now Broadway star. His new Broadway show is called American Utopia. It's receiving rave reviews. American Utopia grew out of David Byrne's recent world tour, which the British music publication NME said, quote, may just be the best live show of all time, unquote. The production features David Byrne and 11 musical artists from around the globe, including six percussionists performing a selection of songs from, well, throughout his remarkable career, featured on his most recent album, American Utopia, to highlights from his legendary band Talking Heads, including Burning Down the House. American Utopia is just one of David Byrne's current projects. He also recently launched the online magazine Reasons to be Cheerful that highlights solutions-oriented stories around the globe. David Byrne recently came into the Democracy Now! studios on his day off from Broadway. I asked him to talk about the name of his recent album and Broadway show, American Utopia. It's, uh, wow. Partly because it's sort of the last thing you expect to hear. <laughs> the, the, the words, especially connected with me and at this particular time, everything that's going on, it's kind of like, is he serious? Is, um, is he being ironic? Is he, uh, does it have some other, other kind of meaning? Uh, and I thought, no, let's, let's be serious about it. Let's be sincere about this. And although utopia may never exist, may never be achievable, let's think about what it is we want and what, what it is we would like to change and what we would like to, where we would like to be, what we, how would we like to be, and that kind of thing. And I thought, that's, Part of what we're part of what the show is, it, it shows people uh, an alternative way of being. You also quote James Baldwin in the play. I still believe we can do with this country something that has not been done before. It's not typical of him, but I thought, but he said this, and I thought, so he, despite all his life and everything he wrote about, he didn't give up. He didn't get totally cynical. He felt like there's still possibility here. So you share that optimism? Not every day, but as, as I try to. I try to keep that alive. So I called this production a play, because that's what we say on Broadway. It's not really—well, it's certainly not just a play. It's not a rock opera. What words do you use? Um, I think we just call it a show, but <laughs> it's—OK. Um, it evolved from a, a concert tour, as you mentioned, but then we realized that, OK, in a Broadway setting, um, you have the opportunity to do something else with it. You're still going to play a lot of songs, but you have the opportunity to kind of make an arc and tell sort of a story. And I don't mean a literal story like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, but uh, you can kind of uh, make it in a story of ideas that takes you from one place and then you end up somewhere else at the end. And you begin by talking about how Babies um, have way more connections in their brains than we do. Yes, yes. Uh, it really is something I read recently, uh, that babies have a lot more neural connections than we do, and that as, as I grow up, until we're 20 years old, those connections are being pruned and, and stripped back. And what a thing to, <laughs> what a thing to think about, I thought, um, that the, on the face of it, the kind of our, it, it would seem like, well, does that mean that we're less, the babies somehow have more or perceive more or than we do, and that we have, and I think, I think it's kind of true. I think babies are kind of getting everything. They just can't make any sense of it, and they're trying to figure it out. And to try to figure it out, they have to say, I'm going to ignore this, and uh, this is, Mom is more important than that person over there. 
So <clears throat> babies have more connections, but then as we grow older, maybe to compensate a little, uh, we build connections outside. That's um, what I'm saying. I'm saying that our, the, our social connections, our connections with other people, is something that we, as you said, that we grow as, as we mature. And the show, American Utopia, is uh, certainly a manifestation of that. I mean, it's, it's so simple—I won't exactly use the word austere, but very stripped down. And explain who you wrote this show um, for. Oh, I th uh, <laughs> I'm sure that, like a lot of things I do, the, the show is conceived as a kind of therapy for myself. You want to—can can we present something uh, like this, and is it going to have the effect on me and on the audience that, that I hope it might? Um, I imagined that by stripping everything away, all the projections and equipment and uh, stage paraphernalia, and leaving it be just us, and uh, just us, all the musicians, I thought, that puts us kind of on the same level as the audience, in a way. We're not protected by having all this stuff. It's just kind of us as human beings talking to you all out there as human beings. And I thought, that can be pretty powerful. I mean, you see it with a stand-up comedian or somebody like that doing something like that, but you don't see it in a music show very often. So I thought, let's see if, if that feels like a more immediate kind of connection between us and the audience. And then we'll start from there and see, see where that goes. So here you have um, 12 musicians, including yourself. And you are all there in your somewhat austere gray suits, <laughs> but the opposite of austere as you perform. And you introduce us to everyone with a simple sentence. Can you share that sentence um. about immigration? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's that. Yes. Um, I make various points throughout the show, but I try and always make it very, be very, uh, whatever, personal or immediate or not a kind of didactic point, but kind of like, there it is. You see it right in front of you. Uh, and in, at one point, I I'm, I'm make a point that Myself, I'm a naturalized citizen, and some of the from band, Scotland. Yep, some of the band members are from France and Brazil, etc. And I, so I said, "Yes, we're all immigrants, and this show, you know, would not exist without us being able to be here." So, would you like to elaborate further, uh, because you have more than a sentence in between performances about the pointed reference that you're making about oh, this, immigration, this about one. this? For example, show not being able to happen if it weren't for all of you from around the globe. Exactly. So, uh, I, the audience. The, the the good thing about the putting that in the context of the show is the audience gets it immediately. They've just they've been dancing and enjoying this music, and then you realize, then you can say to them, this thing that you've just enjoyed, it wouldn't be here unless these people were allowed into our country. That includes me. And so it's, it's a very—it's kind of a very visceral way of making the point, rather than kind of a, a dogmatic policy way. It's like, you just enjoyed something. That wouldn't have happened if we weren't, weren't here. In 2018, you said it in a slightly different way. Last year, <laughs> you said you created an online playlist titled Beautiful Holes in response <laughs> to Trump's comments. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people did write me from various places and say thank you for this. Um, yeah, and I thought, well, let the music speak. Let the music speak for people from these countries, and let's, you know, have, have a listen to the music that they're making, which is incredible. Can you give us a thumbnail, David Burns, sketch of your life, how you came into music, especially for young people? Talk about where you were born, where you grew up, and then how you discovered music. Um, okay. I was born in Scotland. My parents came with me to Canada 
and then moved to Baltimore for work. I was in high school, say, in the late 60s. I'm old enough to, to have experienced that. And the explosion of kind of pop music. Lots of kids wanted to be in bands or be musicians or perform or this kind of thing, and I did too. I was very, very shy, but I re realized that performing became an outlet. I could get on stage and do kind of outrageous things and then retreat into my shell. And I'd kind of, I'd had an outlet. I'd kind of announced my existence and my creativity, and then I could kind of retreat again. I, maybe relevant to kind of young people, I had no ambitions to be a musician. Um, I, my ambition was to be a fine artist and show in galleries and things like that. That's what I wanted to do. Um, or to be a, an engineer, like go tech, do technical kind of work. Your dad did that? My dad did that. And I liked that too, and I saw a creativity there that was similar to the arts, but it was always, in, in our world, it's always kept very separate. Um, so I thought of music as, uh, what do you call it, an avocation? It was something that, was, that I did for pleasure with friends, and I took it very seriously, but I never thought that it would be a, a career or a way to make a living. I thought, there's people who have gone to school for this, and there's people who are really, really good. Uh, I'm just doing it for fun. But eventually, it kind of won out. So you went to RISD, Rhode yeah, Island School of Design. School, and I went to Maryland Institute, another art school, and uh, I was constantly making things with her in hopes of kind of getting a show. I had no idea how to do that. But at the same time, I was writing songs. And yes, auditioned at uh, some clubs down, downtown, and I kind of, I was very lucky. We were very lucky. It was kind of the right the right thing at the right moment and the right time. Uh, and the, there were other groups emerging from this club. The press all of a sudden was kind of paying attention to what was going on. We were playing original music, um, which was very unusual at that time, to, for bands that are kind of at a bar to just play original music. That was... Like the Ramones you opened for? Yes, the for? Ramones. There was a group called Television, Patti Smith. Um, so we were all kind of playing the same, same venues, same places. Your college pal was named? I had a college pal named Mark Kehoe, and I had my friends that were in Talking Heads were um, Chris and Tina, um, Chris France and Tina Weymouth. And then we brought in another guy to play keyboards. And, and Tina, actually, she wasn't—she didn't naturally play the bass guitar. No, she didn't. She, uh, like Chris, they were, they were painters. They were, they were also from art school, but they, and their training was as painters. But they, Chris especially, liked music. And Tina took an interest and decided that she would learn. So you needed a bass guitar, so she yeah, figured, yeah, okay, I'll she, do that. Well, she said, I'll do that. And I said, so fine, fine. I think that um, it, coming out of, say, a, a sort of arty <laughs> milieu, uh, I think we felt that uh, virtuosity in itself was not a high priority. It was not a, not a value as, as far as music goes. What was more important was that what you had to communicate. And that if you, you could communicate that with fairly simple means, um, if that's what was available to you. you if, as long as you, I mean, you didn't try to do something that was beyond your means, but you could. You could, with very little, you could communicate quite a lot. And so the idea that we just brought in friends who would learn how to play didn't seem that strange to us. So you play at CBGB's, not very much. You open for the Ramones, and a music producer hears you from outside on the sidewalk. Um, well, yes. Yeah, so it, uh, people in the kind of music world and record labels and the, pre the kind of um, alternative press, etc., started coming and hearing us and the other bands, and we were very lucky to be that to be part of that that at that time. I mean, if we would have been, I can imagine if we uh, if we'd have been somewhere else doing the exact same thing, we would have gone completely unnoticed. I mean, I like to think that we were writing s something that had some kind of 
interest and quality to it. But I also know that there's a certain amount of luck involved as well. We're continuing our conversation with David Byrne, co-founder of Talking Heads, star of the new Broadway show American Utopia. The show's drawn some comparisons to the Talking Heads' 1984 concert film Stop Making Sense, which was directed by Jonathan Demme. He shot uh, a performance we did, and that's kind of—it's kind of a record document of a tour that we were doing at the time. It's so like four nights in a row? Yeah. We, he shot four nights in a row in one place so that it could be edited together to appear to be one night. Um, and that was kind of the tour that we were doing. It's a, the film version is a little compressed, but um, similar to this, the show that I'm doing now, it was a, um, a very simple idea, but then fairly complicated to realize it. In that one, the idea was start with a stage with nothing on it, bring everything on that, and show the audience what it takes to make a show bring on the lights and projectors and the wheel and the equipment and this and that. And they get to see everything assembled one by one until by about, uh, I don't know, halfway through, it's everything is working and it's like, oh, we've seen how this comes together now. It's, it was a, an attempt to be really transparent. So tell us about your collaboration over the years with Brian Eno, one of the great music producers of the last decades, how you met him and what it meant for the two of you to work together. Um, Talking Heads worked on three records with Brian Eno, and I've worked on two or three with him as well, including this most recent one. And we were introduced when we played in a small club in London. It was our first show in England by another musician, a guy named John Cale, who was in a band called The Velvet Underground that we—and we idolized John and Velvet Underground and Brian Eno and the band he was in, Roxy Music. So this was like we were, we were kind of bowled over by meeting these people that we admired very much. Um, what, similar to what I was saying about um, working with musicians who weren't virtuosos, Brian isn't, say, a virtuoso musician or technician, but he has lots of ideas, um, and he's willing to experiment a lot in the studio and whatever. So that appealed to us. Uh, it also appealed that, that we could talk to him uh, just as a friend, as a person, and it wasn't all music business talk. Um, you could spend a whole evening together and never talk about music at all, which I thought was a good sign. You collaborated on, for example, Izimbra. Talk about Izimbra. Um, in the <laughs> yeah, in the, okay, in the in the show that we're doing. I mentioned that uh, Brian Eno suggested that we use this um, nonsense poem by a Dada artist named Hugo Ball for the <coughs> lyrics of, of a song that we were having trouble finding lyrics to. We, again, we had the music and a melody, but we couldn't figure out the lyrics. So the kind of world of these Dada uh, in the current show, I describe a little bit what was going on at the time with the context of what these Dada artists were doing. Um, Hugo Ball and another one that I was more familiar with, Kurt Schwitters, they both did these kind of nonsense chants or poems or, well, Schwitters called his, his a sonata. Hugo Ball and quite a few of the others became exiles. This was in the 30s. Um, a lot of them moved to, they were exiled to Zurich. They ended up in Zurich and a lot of them hung out at a, a performance place there. A lot of their art was performance-based, and it was called Cabaret Voltaire. So it was this community of exiles and refugees that came together making this art movement. Fleeing the Nazis. Yes, fleeing the Nazis, and a lot of them converged there. They felt that their art was, a, in a way, a response to the kind of craziness that they were seeing in the world. Their art was very kind of absurd and uh, funny and 
but they felt like, it, it was, in a way, it was a direct response to what they were seeing around them. So why did you feel it was important to address fascism in the 80s and now again right now? I never say that, but I, but I, I think the connection is pretty obvious to an audience. I d describe the context that they are, that, that these nonsense poems and their artwork came out of. There had been an economic crash, the Nazis were coming to power, and there was— um, and yeah, the whole countries were sliding into authoritarian and fascist regimes. And I thought, sometimes I'd pause and I'd go, and let, just let that sink in. Um, and see if you, if you might see some parallels there. But I never say that. Um, let the audience make the connection. And then I go on and uh, talk about how these artists respond, their, what their response was. Um, do you have a great desire to burn down the house right now? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm trying the reasons to be cheerful thing. I'm giving it a good try. So explain reasons to be cheerful. Explain what you've started with this online magazine. And uh, It started uh, at least a couple of years ago. Like a lot of people, I'd wake up in the morning and read, read a lot of news and end up either depressed or cynical or angry or whatever. And I thought, well, that's a reasonable response, given what I'd read. But I also thought, this is not good for my health. And it's also not good for how to, how to respond to these things that I've been reading about. Uh, in that, being in that, finding yourself in that frame of mind isn't a very constructive place to kind of respond to it. So I thought, uh, so I started saving things that seemed hopeful or uh, and, and initiatives, sometimes small things that had been done in a, ta in a little town or in another country that had proved to be successful. And at first I started just posting those online, and then more recently it became more official with a little team of editors and writers and uh, web designers and all that kind of thing. And it's often called solutions journalism. Uh, it, focuses not just on good news, like some, someone's donated a lot of money to schools or a, someone has done a good deed, but on a whole initiative that uh, has proven to be successful and that one would hope can be then used as a model and, and adopted by other places. That's the idea. Um, we don't have the time. We don't, we, we're not activists in that we don't try and get these things adopted, the assumption is that if we put it out there, um, people might discover it and realize, oh, someone's found a solution to this. Maybe, maybe we should look at that. I'm, I, it constantly shocks me that um, people trying to reinvent the wheel with various policies or whatever it might be, when you realize, but wait a minute. They've got a perfectly good health system, let's say, that works over there. Why don't we just do that? <laughs> so one of the things um, uh, that you've gotten involved with is the Bard Prison Initiative. Can you talk about that as oh, yeah, one of that, these solutions? Um, that, yes. Okay. Uh, Bard College, just a little bit upstate here, um, started a program where uh, inmates at some of the colleges in that area, and there's quite a few prisons in that area, um, can actually get degrees, full-on degrees. Uh, they st and they have teachers, and, they, and it works. People get the degrees. What happens is um, they emerge then from the prison ready to get jobs, uh, trained, or and not just trained in making license plates or something like that, but real training. And the recidivism rate, the rate that they might go back, get back in prison, just drops. I mean, it's like, pew. So uh, the recidivism rate in the United States is, is terrible. I mean, it's, it's like, instead of preparing people to return into society, it's almost like you're creating criminals. You're creating prison, because that ends up being what they know. This turns that around and makes people uh, have a, a 
possible future, and, and it works. So other places have been adopting it. Other colleges and universities, I know, I think Wesleyan in Pennsylvania and a few others. And so kind of step by step, it gets adopted and seems to be a good alternative to what generally happens in prisons here. So I wanted to ask you about riding your bicycle. Uh, I've been reading your books, How Music Works and Bicycle Diaries. Um, you didn't ride it here today, but we often see you somewhere in town riding that bike. When did you start? I soon remember starting uh, in the late 70s. Um, I lived in Lower East Side and Soho, and there wasn't a lot of taxi service there. Taxis at that time, to me, would have been kind of expensive. Um, and so if I wanted to go hear some music or go see an art gallery opening or visit friends or this or that, I discovered that my old bike that I had as a child worked really well. And uh, I abandoned it sometimes, but then eventually came back and realized, oh, this is a great way to get around. Um, and now New York and a lot of other cities have become a lot more accommodating. There's a lot more bike lanes and there's a whole bunch I just announced the other day there's a whole bunch uh, planned to go in in the next couple of years. And, of course, now with the whole issue of the climate catastrophe, you are leading the way. Well, thank you, but I'd, I realized that I started doing it because it was practical and it felt good. It's a, it's a really nice feeling, um, unless you're terrified and <laughs> you're riding in the middle of traffic. But if you're in a protected bike lane or something, riding along the river. It's really a wonderful feeling. Um, it's hard to explain, just kind of coasting and steering and the winds blowing and all that. And I realized that's, that feeling is what's going to convince people to do that. The, the, the effect is it lowers the carbon footprint. But you're not going to get, to people, get people to ride just by saying, you have to ride to lower your carbon footprint. It's very hard, I think, to convince people to do things because it's, because it's good for them or good for society in general. Which brings me to the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> uh, and I'm not just going to— I gonna... mentioned her on the sh in the show the other day. You did. Got, it got applause. <laughs> so she comes to this country, and she won't fly because she um, is deeply concerned about greenhouse gas emissions. She takes this high-speed, zero-emissions sailboat, comes into New York Harbor. And, of course, we now know her as the young woman who addresses world leaders at the U.N. Climate Action Summit a few weeks ago. And as they applaud her when she gets up with her long braid, she says, how dare you? People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? But I wanted to go to a different aspect of Greta, or, or it's partly what motivates her. And it also is a link between you and her. And your book, How Music Works, you write about how you felt you suffer from borderline Asperger's. And um, that's something Greta talks about. She was here sitting in the chair you're sitting in. Um, and she talked about what she called her superpower. Let's watch. When I am really interested in something, I, I get super focused on that. And uh, I can spend hours upon hours not getting tired of of reading about it and still be still be interested to learn more about it and um, that is very common for people on the autism spectra and um, yeah and and it just I think that was one of the reasons why why I was one of the few who really reacted to the climate crisis because I couldn't connect the dots why, why people were just going on like before and still saying, yes, climate change is very important. I don't get that 
double moral in a way. Um, the difference from between what between what you what you know and what you say and what you what you do, how you act. So that's Greta Thunberg, 16 year old Swedish climate activist. And we met her in Poland at the last UN climate summit. She was 15. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, her Twitter handle said, you know, 15 year old climate activist with Asperger's. Um, so you also have talked about that in your life. I think I've largely grown out, grown out of it. That often happens, so I read. Um, but I was aware, yes, that uh, when I was younger, um, I sh as Greta says, I was painfully shy, but I would also find an interest, and I would just, like, bury myself in it, um, which was, as, as she says, is a kind of nice thing to be able to do sometimes, it's, and, and not everybody can do that. And I thought, I never felt that I was handicapped. I felt that it was just different. Um, and I felt And where that, did the difference get expressed? Well, I think that the fact that I was felt uh, socially awkward, that pushed me to, to perform. Uh, that I fact I could say things I wanted to say, I could announce my existence and be in front of people in a performance setting, and then I could retreat into my, my kind of sh shell after that, but I'd managed to find an outlet. David Byrne, the legendary musician, now Broadway star. When we come back, we'll talk more about his Broadway show, American Utopia, as well as Janelle Monet, police violence, and more. Why are elections important to you? And what do you think about the fact that so few people vote in the United States and other parts of the world and places like Haiti? I mean, in the past, people have been gunned down when they go to the polls or even when they run, but still they do. In this country, um, little more than, if we're lucky, half the population who can vote votes. Yes, I allude to this, or not just allude, I, I kind of bring that up, the, uh, the voting turnouts especially in local elections, can be pretty dismal. So I'm trying to say, you know, this really does make a difference. Local representation, local laws can really have a, a huge effect. Um, you might feel that uh, impotent in regards to the federal government, to the larger thing, but a lot of change can happen locally, and that can kind of accumulate. So, yeah, I've been pushing for that. The, yes, there are, there are countries that have mandatory voting, um, and if you don't vote, they take your driver's license away. I think that might be, <laughs> that's a, I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, getting your driver's license taken away, or? Well, no, uh, I think voting. Mandatory, mandatory voting, that is kind of like, if you're going to live here, you have to participate. And what about ranked voting? Ranked voting uh, is a system where, yes, it's, it's ranked. You go, this is my favorite candidate. This is the second, third, fourth. So if the first one doesn't win, things kind of move around. And the, the end result is that the person who ends up winning, it's, it's a more representative choice. It represents more the opinion of the voters instead of being, uh, you know, a person winning by one vote and that's it. And then half the half the voters feel like that was not what I wanted. Um, in that s system, there's much less wasted votes. Wasted, as in um, my vote didn't move the needle at all. It's it's a system where everybody's vote does move the needle a little bit. I wanted to get back to American Utopia. There is uh, just an incredibly powerful moment in this show um, where you're singing someone else's song, mm -hmm. giving, of course, her full credit. And I wanted to turn to her, um, Janelle Monet, when she performed at the Women's March the day after President Trump was inaugurated.
Janelle Monáe singing Hell You Tombaugh, and what's really significant is where she's singing it the day after President Trump um, was inaugurated, when he was talking about his inauguration crowd being bigger than President Obama's, and then the next day, this mass of women, hundreds of thousands of women, putting his crowd size to shame. Um, you were there that day, David Byrne. Uh -huh. Yes, lots of lots of us showed up, and and then of course we were all asking ourselves, what does this mean, and when, what does this accomplish anything? What does yeah, what does this do us all being here? And uh, there were people who were being dismissive and saying, oh, this is just people kind of manifesting, and then it, they'll forget about it tomorrow or whatever. But I think not. I think people. There's such a strong feeling when that many people assemble. Um, there was this great feeling of uh, com camaraderie, people from all different walks of life and, uh, being there, that that kind of stays with you. You can kind of use—that's sustenance. You can, you can use that. So talk about using that and what you did reaching out to Janelle. I'd heard this song that she did. She did a recording of it. In, uh, I found it one of the most moving, I guess you'd say, protest songs that I'd ever heard. Um, I thought what was special about it was it's an, an, um, it's, a, it's a requiem. It's just naming these people and asking you to remember these people who have been taken, these people who have been killed. So it doesn't try to ex explain in a direct way. You, you can put it together for yourself, what's going on. Freddie Gray, say his name. Freddie Gray, won't you say his name? Ayanna Jones, say her name. Ayanna Jones. It just says, remember, remember this, and don't forget them. So I thought, uh, given the times we live in, I thought it's, <laughs> I often do a song by someone else, and I thought it's time to do a song that uh, has kind of some weight to it the response to the times that we live in. So I asked her uh, what she would think of me doing this, that song. She loved the idea. She was, you know, got a beautiful letter back that she said, yes, love this, songs for everybody. So how do you feel when you sing it every night um, at it the is, theater? I have to say, it is rough doing that every night. It's There's, not just you, of course. It's the whole ensemble. Yeah, the whole group, and, and it's a part of the show where we put down all our regular instruments. We're all just playing percussion and and, and seeing these names. And yes, it's incre incredibly moving. And sometimes it's really hard to get through it. Um, my, you know, my voice cracks, and yeah, it's it's that kind of song. And, of course, you're singing about police brutality, whether it's at Tatiana Jefferson or with Sandra Bland, whether it's Amadou Diallo or mm -hmm. it's Sean Bell. And, of course, these names are continually being added to. Yes, we keep changing the names and updating the names, and there's names that people will uh, be very familiar with and others that they won't know as much. I wanted to ask you about a difficult time, David Byrne, after American Utopia, the CD, came out. You put a statement out, um, essentially apologizing for the all-male musical uh, cast uh, who recorded this. Can you talk about how that happened? And one of the things, I think, that comes out very much in American Utopia is you say, I'm part of the problem. And you very honestly said that after the CD came out? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, I've, uh, I collaborate with all sorts of people, uh, genders, races, et cetera, uh, most of the time, but I was, <laughs> yes, I was caught out. Uh, and I, what was interesting was I didn't even realize it, that I had made a record and it was almost, uh, it's all men who, were contributed to making of the record. And so I thought that's, that's important that you can, uh, that someone like myself who thinks of himself as being aware and uh, yes, of, about all this, 
it's so deeply embedded in us uh, as, as people in the culture that, um, as I say in the show, I said, I myself have to change. It's, um, I can be as guilty, despite saying I don't want to, I can be as guilty as anyone else of this kind of discrimination. And, of course, you have a new CD out, which is the live production of American Utopia, and that has the women and men in this performance. Yes, yes it does. So, Caetano Veloso, uh, the Brazilian artist who you have collaborated with over time. In fact, you're deeply involved with Brazilian music. Um, what brought you into that world? Um, it was quite by accident. I, I was working, and then on some of my spare time, I would go to a record store, and I was just very curious. I would see these records, and I had no idea what they were. Um, and so I bought a few, listened to them, and I thought, these are really good. I really, <laughs> this was in the, uh, in the mid-'80s. And so I went and bought more, and then I bought more, and then I bought more, <laughs> and then eventually I thought, this is—I love this stuff. Um, what I heard was music that was uh, really beautiful, melodic, and, and emotionally touching, but that also had, in, in other ways, was very radical and had, had things to say. O analfabetismo Somado psicopneumático And and yet I thought in their country these are successful pop artists uh, what a wonderful thing that um, that it does it never turns into a formula that they're uh, they're valued for this kind of experimentation and the, the work that they do. So I thought, uh, yeah, I, I wish things could be more like that here, but I'll, I'll take, it, take it where you can get it. Uh, so, this whole movement called Tropicalia. Yes, a lot of it came out of that and then continued later. There was a kind of, yes, so there was a revolution, I guess, in the late 60s, early 70s that was eventually suppressed by the military government there, but it had a long long-term effect. Uh, and Caetano, in fact, himself, of course, was and was jailed. Yes, he was jailed. So was uh, Gilles, uh quite a number of others, and, and similar uh, musicians that I met later in Argentina and Chile. They were exiled or jailed. Uh, anyway, so we, we became friends and have kind of either collaborated or uh, just kept in touch now for a very long time. Caetano Veloso, sometimes called the Bob Dylan of Brazil, has been speaking up very much about the authoritarianism in Brazil today with um, Bolsonaro, the new president known as the Trump of, uh, of the Amazon. Um, and he was introducing a film recently, The Edge of Democracy, by mm -hmm. uh, Petra Costa, um, talking about the jailing of Lula, the Worker Party president, and the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff. Um, how does it feel for you to see—and it's not only in Brazil—but to see this country, um, Brazil, turning towards authoritarianism? It's really sad. Uh, it's but also the, the massive movements that are yes, resisting. Yes, I've seen this film, The Edge of Democracy, and, and it, it's, it explains a little bit how it happened, kind of step by step. Um, there's a lot of machinations about how getting, trapping Lula and uh, kind of moving pieces around so that these people could take control of the government. Uh, yes, it's it's really sad. It's a, I, I was a country I love. I love what they you know how they live and what what, how, what they stand for. But and this seems like a, a real tragedy. Um, it's it's well, you can't help but look at at it as being a, something that is a, a symptom, and that things like. Uh, this are happening all over the world. 
this kind of rise of authoritarians, um, which is frightening, but in some cases, um, you wonder what drove people to kind of, in some cases, they, this was forced upon them. In other cases, there was a, there was a kind of desire for a strong man. Uh, and you wonder, how does that happen? Do you see parallels here? Oh, yeah, I see parallels here and in the Philippines and other places. Um, one of the things I've been thinking lately is that uh, the, the, sometimes the context uh, that people find themselves in. Um, in this case, in, in our case, it might be the context of uh, job stagnation, that they don't see a future for their children or something along these lines, or they don't, they no longer trust the government combined with um, the kind of rise of the internet and social things where there's, there's no fixed truth anymore. Everything is up, every story is up for grabs and any, anybody can be saying anything. And I thought all those factors um, have a, a huge effect on people. And it's not that, I think it's, it's m more the, the situation like that drives people into a kind of desperate search for something as opposed to it being something innate in, in people. You mentioned the Philippines. Um, what we're seeing today with the authoritarian leader, the close Trump ally, uh, Duterte, um, you did this incredible, you wrote this incredible uh, musical track for, or you can tell me how you describe it, I know the <laughs> lingo, um, for a public theater production called Here Lies Love. And that's about a previous dictator and dictator's family, Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. It was a, a well, a musical about the rise and eventual, eventual fall of the Marcos dynasty or the Marcos regime at that point. There, are, many of them are still still around. Um, the cha Imelda loved going to discos, so I set the show in a disco. So it's a very kind of festive atmosphere. It was a world, an atmosphere that she would have been familiar with. The challenge, I thought, and of course the audience, we we're all standing you're, you're throughout. The, you're the patrons of the we disco. We don't sit down. Yeah, you don't sit down. You're the patrons of the disco. You're dancing and having a, having a great time. So that was the aim of that, and what I wanted to do was, I wanted the audience to, in some ways, empathize with her and her husband. So I wanted. To, the audience to kind of be on their side and kind of cheer them on, knowing full well that it was going to end up as a dictatorship. Um, the audience knows that, at least I think some of them do, and yet they're swept away and they're cheering, cheering it on. And I thought that to me is key, to let the audience experience that kind of thing and then realize, oh, look where we are now. Let's now we have to get rid of them. Now, it was not only about the Marcoses, but also Nino Aquino, um, who famously returned to the Philippines, and as he's coming down um, from the plane, he is gunned down and assassinated, the man yeah, that Marcos he, was he most threatened by. knew that that was very likely to happen. And, but his, his death, after—it took a few years, but his assassination kind of triggered the events that led to the overthrow of the— uh, Marcos regime, and they called it. They called it people power. It's completely peaceful. It was just people just came out and said, "We're not leaving." We're talking to David Byrne, and uh, he's very good to spend this time with us because he has a grueling performance schedule, <laughs> as he is a Broadway star right now, as Broadway <laughs> stars do. Um, but I want to talk about a few more collaborations, like um, and the people who 
uh, also sing your songs and uh, appreciate what you do, like um, Angelique Cajot, the great singer from Benin, who recently recreated the Talking Heads album Remain in the Light. She told the Financial Times about meeting David Byrne at the club SOBs in New York and said, We started talking music, an American guy that knows about Fela and knows about King Sunny a Day. This dude is crazy, but good crazy. <laughs> One of Angelique's early records, I was heard it and I was blown away and loved her perform as a performer, as a person. So we've known each other for quite a long time. And then, yeah, a year or two ago, she decided to do uh, a Talking Heads cover, a cover of Talking Heads record, top to bottom, which was incredibly flattering. Incredible, yeah. And uh, in some ways, a kind of vindication for me um, that. The, there's always this kind of uh, balancing act between you know, a white musician in New York doing music that uh, admits to having uh, being influenced by African musicians, musicians from other parts of the world. Cultural appropriation, that, that phrase gets thrown around. But somehow, uh, working with Angelique and other things, it becomes, you see that it's, it's more of an exchange and it goes every which way. That was David Byrne, the legendary musician, artist, and now Broadway star. His show, American Utopia. And that does it for today's show. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Massoud, Sharina Nadura, Tamari Astudio, and Maria Torresena. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.